continue to talk amongst yourselves for just a moment. I'll be right back. <laughs> two, this is your two-minute warning to worship. We are back. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. Does everyone have their bulletin? Because I have mine now. <laughs> Doesn't do me any good on my desk now, does it? Because I have announcements in here for you. Welcome, uh, everyone, here on this uh, second Sunday of July. Uh, Sherry's going to have an announcement for us uh, here in just a minute uh, about a big event coming up uh, this Friday. Uh, but want to mention uh, to all of you first, she makes her way up, that uh, we have uh, formally hired Joan Bennett to serve as our administrative assistant. Uh, she served as our assistant treasurer here over the last several years, so she continues to serve the church in this capacity, uh, but also serves in the church office as the administrative assistant. Feel free to stop by and say uh, hi to her. Um, office is open from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday through Friday, and I won't be there this week, so stop by. Sherry will be there. And uh, stop and say hi to her and say hi to Joan. So, Jerry, go ahead. Um, this Friday at 8 p.m. is our movie night, family movie night on the lawn. Um, so would invite you to invite friends and come on out. The Kona Ice Truck is going to be there. You can buy some cool treats and enjoy Raya and the Last Dragon with us. Um, also bring lawn chairs or blankets, whatever you'd like to be comfortable. Um, we're going to have a good time together. And in the event of inclement weather, we'll be uh, in the sanctuary for that. I mean, you, not me. I probably won't be there. So um, I will not be here next Sunday. Sherry will be preaching uh, for us next Sunday. We'll be here in the sanctuary, 9 o'clock, same time. In two weeks, the last Sunday of July, we'll be out on the front lawn again, uh, weather permitting and as the Lord allows. Uh, we'll be out there for worship at 9 o'clock. Uh, immediately after that time of worship, there is going to be a fellowship time. I believe that's sponsored by our deacons uh, here coming up at the end of July. So that takes us through the month of July. Summer is just uh, moving along here. So th that concludes our morning announcements uh, for today. Uh, prepare our, let, th let us prepare our hearts as we gather together in worship.
Those were pictures from our Vacation Bible School last week that you saw scrolling there during our prelude. Please join me as we gather in worship uh, here this morning with our call to worship that comes to us from Psalm 85. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Please join me in a word of prayer. We thank you, O God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for this day of resurrection that you have gathered us together in worship. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that speaks to us faith in Jesus Christ, and we pray that your Spirit may move powerfully in this place and in our lives here today as we worship together this morning. Open our hearts again to hear the good news of our salvation that has come in the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Be with us now, O God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn for us this morning is Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Please stand. As we worship together, let us affirm our faith by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us confess our sin before the living God together with our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. O Lord, our God, you are the King of glory. Should we not throw open the doors and welcome you? Yet we stand in this holy place with unclean hands and impure hearts. We have lifted up our souls to the false idols of our culture, to greed and power, to fame and wealth. We have been deceitful in our words and deeds. Yet with all the world, we are yours. Forgive us, O God. Fling open the doors of our hearts and come in. You are the King of glory, and we will sing your praises. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sin in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that is good. I declare to you this day, in the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Amen.
You may be seated. I unfortunately see no children, so here we So many years I heard it told <clears throat> The story of compassion A prodigal son who left the fold And found no satisfaction So many days of trusted grace And yet I have to wonder How many times my human strength Has kept me from surrender Holds me in. 
Thank you, Maria. As we enter into our prayer time here this morning, we want to uh, continue to pray for the ministry of Pine Springs Camp as the summer continues there, and a prayer specifically for Jimmy Shoup, whom we've adopted this summer, counselor there. Let's come before the Lord in prayer together. We thank you, O oh God for this time together in worship and this time now in prayer as you call us from the busyness of our lives and the the chaos, as it seems, of the world around us to this place that we call sanctuary uh, and a time to reflect on your goodness and your love, a time for us to be uh, renewed and revived here for a new week that is before us. We thank you for this time in worship and time together here in prayer. Lord, we thank you for all that is set before us uh, here and just pray that you would uh, continue to move us and guide us and bless us. We lift up to you our movie night Friday night. We pray for our families and our children that will be joining us for that. We pray that you would continue to guide us as we reach out to our community with the good news of Jesus Christ. As we pray together today, we lift up to you those in need of healing. We pray for those who are recovering from illness and surgery. We lift up to you the names that are listed in our bulletin here today. Remind us that we are to be people of prayer, O God. We continue to pray for our world. It's a continuing season of pandemic. We uh, pray for uh, those who are, are suffering from the COVID-19 virus. We pray that you would uh, continue to, to guide us, O oh God, through this uh, and that we may uh, view life from an eternal perspective and help others uh, to see the world the way that you do, O oh God. Uh, help us to, to show others uh, your love. So we pray together, O oh God, we are reminded of our place in your kingdom, and we're reminded of the ministry that we're involved in at Pine Springs Camp, and we pray especially for Jimmy Shoup here this morning and for uh, his week to come here, and Lord, that you would continue to sustain him and strengthen him and encourage him uh, as he serves as a counselor at Pine Springs Camp. We ask your blessing uh, upon that ministry there, O oh God, and for the, uh, the children that will hear the good news of Jesus Christ in that place. We thank you. As we pray together this morning, we ask that you would quiet our hearts as we come before you in a few moments of silent prayer. Hear our prayers, O God. We thank you for this time together in worship and time together in prayer again. Lord, we thank you that your throne of grace is always available to us, that you hear our prayers no matter where we are. Help us to be people of prayer, that we may cast all of our anxieties upon you, that we may set before you 
all of our plans, that they may conform to your will, O God. Be with us as we live as your people. We ask all things in Jesus' name as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain seated for our our next uh, hymn here, How Majestic Is Your Name. We enter a time now in God's Word. We hear our Old Testament lesson for us today from 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 46 through 51. This is part of Solomon's prayer as he dedicates the temple in Jerusalem. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 46 through 51. When they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and become angry with them and give them over to their enemies, who take them captive to their own lands far away or near, And if they have a change of heart in the land where they are held captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors and say, we have sinned, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly. And if they turn back to you with all their hearts and soul in the land of their enemies who took them captive and pray to you toward the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven your dwelling place Hear their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause, and forgive your people who have sinned against you. Forgive all the offenses they have committed against you and cause their captors to show them mercy. For they, for they are your people and your inheritance, whom you brought out of Egypt, out of that iron-smelting furnace. And from the New Testament this morning, we continue our look at the letter of James, moving into chapter 3 here today. Verses 1 through 12. James writes to us, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault at what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise the Lord and 
Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. We give thanks to God for his word to us today. Please join me in a word of prayer. We thank you for this time together in your word, O God, and we pray that your spirit would open our eyes to your word made flesh in Jesus Christ as we study the scriptures here today. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us in the power of your spirit, guide us in the power of your spirit. Be with us now, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. One of the great communicators of the 20th century was Winston Churchill. He's quoted as saying this about speech. Everyone's in favor of free speech. Hardly a day passes without it being extolled. But some people's idea of it is that they are free to say what they like. But if anyone else says anything back, it's an outrage. Churchill put his free speech into practice one day when a disgruntled female citizen told Churchill, if I were your wife, I'd poison your tea. Churchill quickly replied, if you were my wife, I'd drink it. (laughs) We enjoy a quick comeback, don't we? We get some strange satisfaction when we feel as though we've put someone in their place. The truth is our words matter. Our words are important, and we have so many ways to communicate now. As we study this first century letter, it was only by uh, speech or writing, which was very difficult. We have so many ways to communicate these days, and now our words linger for all of eternity uh, online. James has just told us in uh, chapter 2 that our good works are an overflow of our faith in Jesus Christ that's embedded in our hearts. Now, James is telling us that we should do God's good work with our words as well. Jesus says this about our words in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 45. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks of what the heart is full of. So our words are an overflow of the condition of our hearts. So we take that into consideration here as we move into James chapter 3. The letter of James here, we're picking up on a thought that he introduced in chapter 1. It's the importance of our words. In uh, chapter 1, James says this, he writes this in verse 26, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. So as we hear James uh, plea to uh, be careful uh, with our words, and every, as every Western Pennsylvania uh, mother would say, watch your math uh, today, uh, we hear three thoughts uh, from James uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Uh, that is, we wrestle with our words, and we are to tame our tongue, and finally, we're to rely on the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. So first, we uh, go the wrong way in the slides, and then we uh, wrestle with our words in verses 1 and 2. James chapter 3 here begins, we hear James offering a warning to teachers of God's word. James includes himself here in this warning when he says, we who teach, he's not saying you who teach, but including himself in these words of warning here. He's saying that teachers are held to a higher standard of accountability, true in the first century church, true in the 21st century church as well. Teachers have more opportunity to sin with their tongue. In the early days of the church, worship was not as structured as you will if it is as it is today. There was no Bible at that point, as James is writing. Uh, anyone could provide a lesson if they felt so led by the Holy Spirit. It was considered a sought-after honor to be a teacher, and that is why James is offering this warning. It should not be approached carelessly. I've told you that when I was in college, I lived with my grandmother, and she always had wise words uh, for me, few words, but it was always uh, worth listening to. 
Uh, and her words about uh, entering into the ministry were always, you better be good and sure this is what you want to do with your life. And I hear those words on a regular basis. James is echoing here the teaching of his half-brother, the Lord Jesus, who warns against misguiding those who are young, especially in their faith. We hear Jesus tell his disciples in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better, if, better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones, little ones in faith, to stumble. So watch yourselves, Jesus says. In verse... Looking into verse 2 here, James reminds us that we're all sinners, that we are unable to control our tongue. If we're able to control our mouth, then we would have the ability to control the rest of our body against sin as well. We trust that only Jesus Christ is completely human and completely divine, lived a perfect life, was able to control all of his body and able to control his tongue as well. So James reminds us here that no one is perfect. We hear a portion of Solomon's prayer. We heard that in our Old Testament lesson uh, as he's dedicating the temple in Jerusalem in 1 Kings chapter 8. Solomon is, is reminding God's people of Israel here that they will, they will disobey the Lord, and they have in the past. They'll do so in the future as well. As human beings, we're all sinful. We all stand in need of God's forgiveness, and Solomon is reminding Israel that God will forgive those who seek God's forgiveness. We see the extent of God's desire to forgive us ultimately in the cross of Jesus Christ as he shows his love to all of his creation. The blood that Jesus sheds on the cross covers our sin and restores our relationship with God. We're to trust in this as the only way that our relationship with the living God can be re completely restored, the only way that we're able to receive God's forgiveness. So we are to seek, then, God's forgiveness. Our words can quickly get us into trouble. And, of course, I've said week after week here, looking at James, uh, that I've personally been convicted. Uh, hopefully you have, too, at times. Uh, hopefully you're studying, reading through this uh, letter on your own here. It's only five uh, chapters. We're at about the halfway point here. And uh, it's very convicting here as words uh, to teachers especially. I know, you know, personally, my, my mouth has gotten me into trouble a lot over the years. Uh, it's gotten me out of trouble at times as well. Uh, my dad used to call me the senator because I just asked so many darn questions. He always had good answers, too. And this was before Google. I always appreciated uh, that. So we, we're reminded time and again that our words can get us into trouble, that our words are harmful to others and sinful against God. We're to continue to seek God's forgiveness. When we, we sin with our words, when we hurt others with our words, when we, uh, when we speak uh, not according to God's will, it reminds us of our need for a Savior that has come ultimately in Jesus Christ who provides us with God's forgiveness now and forever. Second here, we're to, to tame our tongue. James continues by giving an example here in verses 3 through 5 of three small things that it can have a great effect uh, in speaking of the power of the tongue. First here, he mentions the bit in the mouth of the horse, a large animal that can be controlled by a small piece of metal in their mouths. Second, he points out the size of a ship rudder in comparison to the rest of the vessel. It takes strong winds or a powerful engine uh, to move a ship, but only a small rudder to steer it. Finally, he mentions the power of one small spark. It has the ability to set an entire forest on fire. And over the past year here especially, we've witnessed the destructive power of wildfires uh, on the news. Thankfully, thankfully, we haven't experienced that uh, personally because, you know, every season is rainy season here in western Pennsylvania, so those forest fires are not so much of a thing. So why is James telling us is he telling us here to be silent? If we're always going to sin uh, with our words, should we take some sort of vow of silence with our lives? It would be easier uh, to do that than to try to be careful with our words. 
But God doesn't want us to keep quiet. He wants us to be careful because we can do so much good with our words. We can encourage and we can compliment one another with our words. We can tell others what our relationship with Jesus Christ means to us. We're able to proclaim the gospel uh, with our mouths and others are able to know Jesus by the words that we speak to them. So we are to, uh, to tame our tongue here and be careful and to glorify God with our speech at all times. So as we do that, though, we're not to take a vow of silence, but we are to be slow to speak. We hear these words of instruction in the Proverbs chapter 10, verses 19 through 21. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, but the heart of the wicked is of little value. The lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for a lack of sense. John Wesley, uh, the founder of the the Methodist uh, tradition, uh, was approached by a believer who proudly told him that he had been blessed with the spiritual talent of speaking their mind. And in citing uh, the parable of the talent by Jesus, Wesley responded by saying that God won't object if you bury that talent. We're to be careful with our words. We're to be slow to speak. As we're slow to speak, though, we're to be quick with praise. Our words reflect the condition of our hearts. We hear Jesus say that. We hear James echo that uh, here in his letter. So uh, words that we say show others what is living in our hearts. So if we often speak critically uh, to others or of others, you may have an angry heart. If your speech is negative, you might have an anxious heart. And if you talk too much, you should go into the ministry. No, if you talk too much, maybe you have an unsettled heart. There's that conviction again. We may want to change the way we talk, and if we want to do that, we must first inspect the condition of our hearts and allow the living God to work in our lives, to give these troubled areas that we have of our heart, of our very lives, over to God so we can praise God with our words and so others may hear of his love from each of us. Finally, here we're to rely on the Holy Spirit. It's impossible for us, James here says here, that it's impossible for us uh, to completely control our tongues. James continues uh, by uh, comparing the tongue to a fire. It's able to do a great deal of damage. And the source, James says, of the tongue's ability to do evil is from Satan himself. The fire of hell that he refers to here is a reference to Gehenna. That was the landfill of Jerusalem. It was south of the city. It was constantly uh, smoldering and on fire. Uh, It was the most horrible place that you can think of. And so Jesus uses that as a reference uh, to hell itself that would have been familiar Uh, to his listeners. Humanity has the ability to tame all sorts of animals, James tells us. But he says that no human being has the power to tame their own tongue, and it's capable of great harm. James points out that we're able to praise God with our mouth, and then with that same mouth, we're able to curse others who are made in God's image. As followers of Jesus Christ, James encourages us not to live in this way. We should only praise God and bless others with our words. And James provides two examples from nature to support this. A spring cannot produce both fresh water and salty water, and a tree can only bear one kind of fruit. So our words should tell others that we desire to bear good, godly fruit with our lives. So as we rely on God at work in our lives in the person of the Holy Spirit, we uh, do our best to avoid evil. Jesus says this about the nature of evil in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. He says what comes out of a person is what defiles them, saying it's not uh, what you put into your body that defiles you, it's what comes out. Uh, For it's from within, it's out of a person's heart. The evil thoughts come, the sexual immorality, theft, Murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All of these evils come from inside and defile a person. 
So we're to avoid those and trust that God is at work in our lives if we've given our lives over to Jesus Christ, uh, and we are to avoid evil and to allow God to work uh, within us, moving away from the sinful ways of the world and moving closer to Jesus Christ. And as we do so, we will bear godly fruit in our lives. The late Philip Seymour Hoffman used a story like this in a homily that he gives in his role as Father Brendan Flynn in the 2008 film Doubt. And that's always stuck with me over the years here. A woman repeated a story that she heard about a neighbor. Within a few days, everyone in the community knew the story. The person she talked about heard the story. And when, when it had been said about her, when she, when she heard this, she was very sad. Later, the woman who had spread the story learned that it was not true. She was very sorry and went to a wise rabbi who asked what she could do to repair the damage. After giving some thought, the rabbi said to her, go home, get one of your feather pillows and bring it back to me. Surprised by the rabbi's response, the woman followed his advice and went home to get a feather pillow and brought it back to the rabbi. Now, said the rabbi, open the pillow and pull out all of the feathers. Confused, the woman did what she was told to do. Then after a few minutes, the rabbi told her, now I want you to find every one of the feathers and put it back into the pillow. That's impossible, the woman said, almost in tears at this point. The window's open and the wind has scattered them all over the room and blown many of them outside. I can't possibly find them all. Yes, the rabbi said, and that is what happens when you gossip or you tell a story about someone else. Once you talk about someone, those words fly from one person's mouth to another, just like these feathers flew in the wind. Once you say them, you can never take them back. We've been set free to use our words to glorify God and to show God's love to other people. So as followers of Jesus Christ, we're to wrestle with our words and be careful with what we say, but we trust that none of us is perfect. We rely on God's grace and God's work in our lives. And when we we sin with our words, it drives us back to Jesus and makes us seek God's forgiveness that has been given to us by faith in Jesus Christ. We're to continue as disciples of Jesus to tame our tongue. And as we do that, we are slow to speak, being careful with our words. And when we do speak, we should praise God and give praise and, and kind words to others as well. As we do this, it's impossible for us within our own power. So we rely on God at work in our lives in the person of the Holy Spirit. We continue to avoid evil in the world that is around us, trusting that God has set us aside for his good and holy purpose. And as we do so, as the Holy Spirit continues to work in our lives, we will bear good, godly fruit for the glory of God. May we be careful with our words and trust that that the Holy Spirit is at work within us to speak the good news of our salvation revealed in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. We thank you, O God, uh, that you call us to speak the good news of Jesus Christ, that you call us to sing your praises. And we pray that we may be careful with our words, that we may glorify you in all that we say. We thank you for your forgiveness that has come in Jesus Christ. And we pray that your Holy Spirit may strengthen us as we speak uh, for your glory here in this week to come. Lord, continue to guide us. We pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for us this morning is Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. Please stand.
receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.